Welcome back to The 99, where we are focused on growing a better competitive commander. I'm your host, Patrick Marlette, and today we are taking a look at some hidden gems and the most underplayed cards in white. But before we jump into this one, I do want to mention first and foremost our partner, TCG Player. If you're looking to pick up singles, packs, and more, that is the best place to do so. It is a global market of LGSs and online stores that sell and ship directly to you. So if you want to pick up cards at their best prices, that is the place to go to because it's literally just everyone on the same marketplace trying to get you the best deal. Also, they have ongoing sales and specials throughout the year, so be on the lookout for those, either kickbacks or more incentives to purchase from them. And better yet, if you want to hook yourself up and hook us up, you can do so through the link in the description. A portion of those proceeds, each sale, will go to help support the channel. Furthermore, if you haven't found out yet, this show is now a podcast, so if you want to be listening to this instead, you can do so in the link in the description as well. It should lead you to Anchor, which is our source site, but also Spotify, where you can listen to each of these episodes instead of viewing them. So if that's more convenient for you, I know some of you are asking for it. Well, there it is now. Lastly, if you want to help support the channel directly, there are now two ways you can do so, either via Anchor, the support button on our homepage, or Patreon. And of course, there are perks for the Patreon members. Uh, at the end of this video, I'm going to be doing a shout out. I have agreed with myself to... <laughs> manage doing that. A lot of people just have like end rolls where they give uh, credit to their Patreon backers. Well, up until we get 99, seems fitting for a show called The 99, I'll be announcing everyone's name just verbally. So if you're listening to this, you're not just going to get one shout out. You will hear everyone that's been backing us up to this point. So thank you everyone who jumped on our Patreon uh, with little to no notice. I really appreciate it, especially in these times. I'm going to date this video here, but if you are an industry affected by COVID-19, of course, you don't need to donate a thing. I'd rather you take care of yourselves, your family, your neighbors, and obviously focus on you first. But let's jump into this one. In the comments section down below, I'm going to go ahead and pin my list so that you guys can see all the cards we discussed today. There are going to be 12 in total we go over. And if you feel there are any hidden gems in white or any of the other colors that you feel are underplayed, let me know in that comment and we'll take your opinions into our next video. This should be an ongoing series for the channel with cards we find are very useful. Also note that a lot of these are deck dependent. You're not going to want to run these in every list. However, some of them actively better your list. So be on the lookout for these ones. Now I'm going to go through these in no particular order in these lists. However, I have them subdivided into separate lists. Interactions, recovery, stacks, and tutors. Yes, there are tutors in white, and we're going to talk about some of them today. First card we're going to talk about is Fragmentize, and for the listeners, I'm going to read all of these off. Fragmentize is one white for a sorcery speed card, destroy target artifact or enchantment with a converted mana cost of four or less. So no, it's no nature's claim, but it's nearly on par with natural state. And in some instances, just a little bit better because you can hit anything in that four CMC and under marks. So what are some threats that I'm talking about here? How about a smothering tithe, birthing pod, greater good, stranglehold? There are a ton of cards, Aetherflux, Reservoir. The thing is, if they haven't gone off yet with those cards, you know, Birthing Pod's a combo card, Aether Flux is a combo card, you can smack those things down. And generally speaking, on a combo turn, maybe someone thwarts him for the table, and you're sitting there with your Fragmentize, you can either help yourself or help everyone else out by eliminating that threat. I mean help everyone else out, I mean stop that player from winning. There are a lot of threats in that 4 CMC range you need to think about, and well below that mark as well. Of course, this is no nature's claim, as I mentioned off the bat. This is limited in the fact that it's sorcery speed. However, there are a ton of utilities for this card regardless. If you need a low cost removal spell, Fragmentize is the one. And it hits everything else too. I mean, we're not just talking about combo pieces here, although it hits a majority of them that are artifact and enchantment. I'm talking about Sylvan Libraries, Ristic Studies, Mystic Remoras. There are a ton of value pieces that folks are going to be using that you don't need to eliminate an instant speed. I mean, one white out of your turn isn't going to make or break your game. I mean, if it's a fast combo list using white, then maybe, but Fragmentize is an essential in my opinion, and it can be seen in a lot more list. It's funny, we, um, we play a power cube and this card's in it, and for good reason. It is no Cyclonic Rift, okay, in its ability to stop a board. However, it is very nearly 
that effective in what it does. And the card I'm talking about is Winds of Abandon. So it's generic white sorcery speed. Again, the same issue as before. We can't all be Cyclonic Rift. Exile target creature you don't control. For each creature exiled this way, its controller searches their library for a basic land. Those players put those cards onto the battlefield's tap, then shuffle their library. In the What's More department, you can overload it for four generic and two white. So I find that it's very fantastic at what it does. In a bogged down board state, this is gonna help you in a large way. So its issues again are sorcery speed and that it costs two to do the basic effect of eliminating a creature, exiling one. But if this game is going long, it becomes mid to late game and the board states are ridiculous. If you wanna be the only one left with a board to work with, and I just mean creatures in this instance, this is the card to play. And in most cases, a lot of players' decks, in CDH at least, and mind you, we're discussing this for competitive list, uh, they're not going to have that many basics. And maybe they don't even have a single basic. A lot of times I find that, and this is um, essentially echoing Path to Exile, which is single target removal at uh, one white, and it does the same thing. A lot of times they don't have a basic to search up. It, unless it's a monocolored list or dual colored list, um, you're not going to see that many basics come out from this effect. I think the last time I played it, who was I playing against? We had a Planeswalker Commander against me, a Sisse, the five color Sisse, and something else. I think that only two basics hit the field after I played this. I, so obviously, again, this is going to be deck dependent. Not every list is going to want to fit this in. It is overcosted for a sorcery speed effect like this. But if you're playing a deck that's slower, that's more adaptive and or more controlling, this is a card that you should definitely consider, especially if you plan to go mid to late game. This is a great way to get rid of your opponent's board states. Of course, it is an impregnable. People can counter this. If you have a Besaiju you in your list, all the better, but this is certainly one I think is underplayed. There's a reason it's in power cubes. There's a reason people play this card outside of Commander, and it's certainly well worth it in a game that's for players, particularly because it's single-sided. This doesn't hurt you at all. I love this card, definitely look out for it. I am using it in my Teshar now, and I love it. Now, one of the last cards I wanna talk about in the interaction suite is one of the great silence effects in white. And sadly, it doesn't see a lot of play outside of mono white. And I think it definitely deserves, or at least warrants, more attention. And that card is Orm's Chant. So Orm's Chant is one white. Target player can't play spells this turn. It's an instant speed effect. It wouldn't be very good if it wasn't. Thank goodness we have at least one instant speed on this interaction suite. So on its base level, this card will stop one third of the players opposing you from you going off. So if you need to combo off and you know that that guy has open mana, well, you silence him and force him to play his counter or interaction and go from there. And if you know what your other opponents are, what they might threaten you with, at least you have one third of your opponents stopped before you try to combo off. Better yet, you can also use this before an opponent tries to combo off, making it so they can't play spells. They can still activate abilities and such, but they will be hampered in that way. Now, the real kicker here is and I mean that literally, is that this has a kicker cost of one white. So for two white, if you paid the kicker cost, creatures can't attack this turn. So let's think of the creatures that matter. Let's just start with the command zone. Uh, Zur, Jila, Godo, Neheb, Tigum, which you've seen on the show multiple times. There are a ton of commanders that care about attack triggers. And if you just stop them in their tracks and say no, well, Zur can't fit, uh, fetch the Necropotence, right? Or in this instance, maybe they want to grab a uh, Grasp of Fate or whatever else might be in their list to, to stop you from going off. There are great utilities attached to the creatures can't attack this turn. Better yet, Najila, she sort of works on that critical mass of just warriors swinging at you. And if you say no, that's really good for your game plan, because you're not going to die that turn. Orm's Chant is a phenomenal card. Obviously, I think there are more creatures outside the command zone that do benefit from this effect. If there's some sort of kiki-jiki combo or combat celebrant combo with mass attack options going on, this is going to stop them too. Do not sleep on this one. This is one of those cards that's undervalued, I mean cost-wise, and underplayed. Definitely look into picking up a copy. The next category I want to go over is recovery, and this is one of my favorite pieces of recovery in white. I never see anyone play it. I believe more people should, because if your deck relies on artifacts or enchantments, 
even if it doesn't on a base level, you just want those things back, this is one of the best cards for it. Argivian Find is one white, instant speed, return target artifact or enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. At any time, at any moment, Tormod's Crypt is on the stack, your deck relies on that Clark, Clark Clan Ironworks, go ahead and grab it. Go ahead and grab that back, put it in your hand, and get ready to go off on your next turn instead. Druid's Repository, maybe you still want to combo off with that Najila deck, well, get that back in your hand too. It's no Noxious Revival in that it's free, but from Grave to Hand is the important part here. That effect is so good. There's nothing that replaces that in terms of value. Okay, so from Grave to top of deck, just fine at instant speed. You're going to draw it anyways, but I can still get something else of value from my deck beyond the piece I, I acquired. And let's just think of those value objects again, the Carpet of Flowers of the World, the Mystic Remorse, as we mentioned earlier. If you just want to get a value piece back, that was definitely eliminated by one of your opponents, or maybe you just let the Mystic Remora die, because you know you can get it back and then not worry about the cumulative upkeep as much by casting it again. This is one of those cards. And even as we discussed Ernesto in the past, Mystic Remora is so good on those combo turns because you're getting to draw. You will be drawing off of people playing spells against you because they're not going to pay four for Mystic Remora. This guy is such a great setup in those instances. And the fact that it's instant speed from grave to hand gives you that many more options. Maybe you do want to wait till it's your turn to figure out what your play is. Maybe you don't want to play this at the end of someone else's turn, depending on what you draw off the top of your deck. This is a very good card. It needs to see more play. I love it. I use it in a lot of decks. It's there for a reason. One of the best recovery cards in white. However, my favorite recovery card in white, it recently released and slipped completely under the radar. I don't see enough people playing this one. I always praise it when it is played, and it is always the VIP when I play it in a game, and that card is Sabine's Reclamation. So for two generic, one white, you get a sorcery speed spell that reads, return target permanent card with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. If this spell was cast from a graveyard, you may copy this spell and choose new target for the copy. So obviously you can cast this in other ways. There's a lot of red spells that let you cast cards from your graveyard. Um, I'm thinking Finale of Devastation, not Finale of Promise. Devastation is the green one. There are cards that let you cast from your graveyard, but this is one of those cards that lets you cast it from your graveyard. Recoup, recoup's another one. Flashback, it has flashback of four generic, one white. So this is obviously a little deck dependent. You might not always need an effect like this, but from your graveyard to battlefield, it can only get one better from our Gibeon Fine, and this is that one better. So you're gonna wanna play it whenever. You're gonna wanna play it early game. Maybe you just use it as ramp. Maybe you retrieve that fetch land, put it back on the field, up your upper land, because it says permanent. You can put any permanent converted mana cost, three or less, those are your lands back onto the battlefield. Or maybe it's that City of Traitors you had to break for that fetch land. Who knows? You can play this early. You can play it mid-game. You can play it late game. In the list I use it in, Tishar, this retrieves the whole list. I get my sack outlet again. I get one of my recovery creatures, either ETB or LTB, and I'm ready to go off to the races. And if someone forgot that it was in my graveyard, I'm already there. I've already passed the finish line. If you let me go off with this, it's probably going to be the end of the game for you. It is a fantastic recovery card. Again, it is situational. You're not going to want this in every list. Maybe you don't rely on permanence that heavily, but this recovery card is fantastic for those decks that require a big setup, that have more than two or three moving parts and or want to get pieces on the field that can help you combo out. Maybe if you're in white, you've got your Grand Abolisher in your graveyard, but someone you know countered it. They really don't want you to have that kind of protection. Get it back with Sabine's Reclamation. Anything at all, really. I mean, even if your Aven Mind Sensor got blown out of the sky from a previous game, get that back too. You don't want people tutoring up their answers. You don't want people tutoring up their win conditions. Sabine's Reclamation is so good. I absolutely love this card. It's super cheap right now, and I don't know why it's not played more. Definitely don't sleep on this one either. Now, the last card I want to talk about here isn't necessarily a white card. However, you do need to be in white to be able to play it. And that is Hall of Heliod's Generosity. This one came out in Modern Horizons and is a fantastic legendary land that one, adds colorless mana or generic mana, whatever you feel, 
to your mana pool, or you can tap it and pay one generic, one white to put target enchantment card from your graveyard on top of your library. Did you hear that last ability? For the cost, it's one generic, one white, and you tap it. So unlike Buried Ruins, where you sacrifice it, unlike Petrified Fields, where you sacrifice it, unlike any other utility land that has a relevant effect, you don't have to sacrifice this one. You can keep doing this. So what kind of enchantments does your deck have? Well, maybe I'm that jerk who likes playing Rule of Law. I'm going to keep playing Rule of Law. You're going to have to waste all your resources to get rid of it. And I am never losing out on my hand size technically by doing that because I am allowed to put this back and draw it again. I'm always up that one card when I draw it and down a card when I play it. And trust me, if the effect is damning enough, I really don't mind recasting Rule of Law a hundred times and or Eidolon of Rhetoric. Why not that one? He's an enchantment too. There are a slew of enchantments and all of the value enchantments I mentioned earlier. Again, your Sylvan Libraries of the world. If you're in Selesnia, hell yes, play this card. Trust me, people don't like Sylvan Library. And for the most part, a list like Selesnia, it's got so much consequential life gain and you're not doing anything with your life as a resource that people are gonna even attack you. So Sylvan Library is a great piece to recover from this because yeah, I wanna lose eight life every turn and draw two more cards. Why did you why did you stop me from doing that? Get it back with Hall of Heliod's Generosity. And better yet, you can crop rotate into this, you can use Sylvan Scrying. This is a well worth it utility. Again, very deck dependent. You don't always want to land that's going to tap for generic. But I think in the two to three color lists, maybe three is even a stretch, if enchantments are at all important to you, you will have a card that rec can recover them at any moment, that never loses its ability to tap for mana because it doesn't self-sacrifice, you can get that back to your hand. It's very fortunate that doesn't say, you know, you may only use this ability at sorcery speed. Again, you can use this at any time. So hold up your mana. If you want to get that value piece back, put it on top of your library, play it again. It is a phenomenal piece of recovery and it's attached to a land. I think people undervalue utility lands in general. Having played mono colors for a couple of years now, I can say that utility lands are my best friend. <laughs> and there are a certain few that really deserve your attention. Hall of Heliod Generosity is definitely up there as one of them. Those are all of our recovery cards. I'm going to do three in each category here. You might notice that trend. The next category I want to move on to is stacks elements. And white's got a ton, but there are a ton I feel don't get enough attention. And this first one is honestly one of my favorites. It's from one of my favorite sets. It has some of my favorite art by Christopher Moiler. This is Samurai of the Pale Curtain. It's double white for a creature fox samurai with Bushido one, if you don't know what that is. When this creature blocks or becomes blocked, it gets plus one, plus one until the end of turn. What? For a 2-2 body. In the what's more department and better still is the ability if a permanent would be put into a graveyard, remove it from the game instead. So any LTB effect of a permanent, generally creatures leaving the battlefields, those effects are dead. I mean, the creature's exiled, but its ability is dead. This shuts off any strategy that relies on a permanent LT being or leaving the battlefield. So it's an amazing blocker. Let's just start there. If you have a 3-3 blocker, she is a virtual 3-3 blocker at any given time on the battlefield, you're probably a leg up on any other player at the CDH table. There aren't that many decks that run blockers better than that, or rather something that could be swinging at you that's better than that. So you're not going to be a free attack for a Timna player. You are in fact going to kill her and exile her if, if she so chooses. And that's likely that person's commander and they'll recast it and that's okay because everything else you're going to be exiling. Your Flash Hulk package, it's dead. Your Gitrog plan, if you don't use Guy's Blessing, then that's dead. You know, I actually, I say that you should, I'm a huge fan of just the giants in that list, the Eldrazi, to get the shuffle effect. Well, it would be dead to Samurai of the Pale Curtain. Um, any reanimate strategy, it's gone. Both the animate aura and the creature, gone. This is obviously not rest in peace. I think rest in peace finds a home in more decks because it's one generic and one white. However, Samurai of the Pale Curtain at double white is more relevant to me. Sometimes I want a blocker. One of the stacks pieces I'm gonna talk about here, I'm definitely gonna want a blocker for it. This card is so good. It's heavily slept on. It's one of my favorite cards. And again, just the art. Just look at the art for this card. I would love a playmat with this. Fantastic stacks piece. You should definitely consider it. 
The next one I want to discuss is Suppression Field. And this one's a little bit of an oddity because it's very painful to play uh, as, as much as it is to go against um, because it is symmetrical in its effect. But it's one generic and one white for an enchantment. Another uncommon, These, that's actually the trend here. Activated abilities cost two more to play unless they're mana abilities. So obviously you don't want to play this in every list, especially if your list consists of Thrasios as the commander, Kenrith as the commander, Najila, Urza, Anya, Anya's hurt really bad if she's in your list or you're going against her. Um, Yisan, Sise. I mean, these are just commanders that you could be going against or have this card in. So you either want to play it really badly to go against those commanders if you see them. Those are just a handful that I thought of. Or you definitely want to incorporate this in your list because your commander does not care about this effect. Like if you're playing Savala uh, Explorer Returned, she's Selesnya, she can play this. Yes! Why not? If you're doing a stack space build of her, her ability is a mana ability. Her parlay... She draws a card from it, everyone does, but it's not like it costs you two more to do this. This shuts down a lot of strategies. I was just thinking of, uh, if we're looking at white, um, the Heliod, the new Heliod Sun Crown with Walking Ballista. You know, good luck, good luck with that. I know that you gain a, you know, a little token when you do that, but it's not gonna be free for you. You need to pay two generic every time you try to hit me with Walking Ballista. That's not gonna happen, not anymore at least. This is a fantastic effect in stacks in white it's an enchantment very easy to slot in there are lots of tutors for enchantments in mono white of course you have mystical tutor but outside of that there are other strategies you can use to get this onto the field and it is always painful to go against this i love it um you should certainly consider it if you're not playing it again it's easier to slot into more lists because it's generic and white cost um, I would definitely look into this one if it doesn't hamper your own game plan. The next card we're looking at, if you have any board presence whatsoever, I'm gonna say you should be running this card. It's just it's just a very good card because of it, what, what it can do immediately when it hits the field. And that card is Gideon of the Trials. It's one generic and two white for a Planeswalker Gideon, duh. Plus one until your next turn prevent all damage target permanent would deal. Permanent, permanent. So. I don't know, they put out a goblin bombardment for their creature-based strategy. They're going to make a bunch of tokens and kill you with it. Nope, not anymore. I mean, that's just one closet case scenario. Generally speaking, he's going to hit a big creature that's aimed at him, and you'll see why in a second. Has one zero ability. Until the end of turn, Gideon of Trials becomes a 4-4 human soldier creature with indestructible... Ooh, that's still a planeswalker. Okay, so Hero's Downfall can still hit him. I guess that's kind of bad. No one mainlines. No one mainlines planeswalker destruction. Let's just... Let's just say that. I mean, even if they did, it's indestructible. Prevent all damage that would be dealt to him this turn. That's pretty good. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like that a lot. And it's last zero ability. You get an emblem with as long as you control a Gideon Planeswalker, you can't lose the game and your opponents can't win the game. Ugh. Dang. That's really solid. Why do I play Angel's Grace? Why do I play Silence Effects? It's because I don't want people going off. Okay, and I would love it if I can have a little emblem on the field that says that too. And he's three CMC, my Savine's Reclamation can pull this guy back. There's so much value here. And this is why I was mentioning Samurai the Pale Curtain as just a decent blocker. Because if you shut off the, the Gitrog, right? We see that on our table. If you shut off any of the attackers that would be going for Gideon, you've got a three, three blocker off to the side. Trust me, those dorks, that Deathrite Shaman, <laughs> They're not going to do anything to Gideon. You will have that on the field constantly. I will say that 70% of the time Gideon of the Trials is countered because no one wants to deal with it. And I can understand that. But again, if you have a board state whatsoever, this is a card to play. Even if you're trying to bait that counter, even if you're conscious that people don't want this emblem on the field, totally understandable. But if it lands and it sticks and you have the bigger board state, like the list I was running this in uh, initially was had an Elish Norn. Um, I'm I'm generally going to be fine. I'm generally going to be fine with Elish Norn out. And again, because people don't mainline Planeswalker Destruction, it is very hard to remove this guy outside of just attacking him directly. The effect as soon as it hits the field, three mana, people can't win the game. I mean, I, why wouldn't you want to play that? 
This guy is so good. Um, the card itself is somewhere in the like 10 to $30 region. I forget. There's a promo version of it too that I own that's a little bit more expensive, but totally worth it. Any copy. This is certainly one to buy if you want to try squeezing it into a list. Again, it's double white, so not every list is going to want to play it. But if you're playing a Staxi mid-range to late game list that's going to combo off, you know, it's not a fast combo deck. This is certainly a card to consider if you want to stop the board from doing so. Rounding off the end of our list here are tutors. And I mean, there are tutors in white more so than red, but we are still low on the tutor count. However, we do have a few hidden gems here that I think more decks should be playing. This first one in particular, Tithe. Tithe is one white for an instant speed spell. You may search your library for a planes card. If you control fewer lands than target opponent, we have one of three people to choose from. You may search your library for an additional planes card. Reveal those cards to all players and put them into your hand. You shuffle your library afterwards. Well, important thing to note here is it says planes, not basic land. It says planes. So if you're running a list, maybe you're a budget list and you can't afford your fetch lands yet, this is a great way to filter through your list and get those shock lands that you need on the field so badly. This is a great way to filter out your deck. Again, because it says any planes you have. So it could be a basic planes and it could be your temple garden. This is a really phenomenal card for not only thinning, but getting lands into your hand if you have a low land count. So the list I use this in predominantly is Teshar. It's a very low uh, CMC curve. I don't really need that much mana on the field to win. As a matter of fact, I've won a game recently where I didn't have any lands. I know. I would have really killed for Tithe though, that game. The extra mana would have been nice for protection, but a turn two win with no lands is always good too. But in that list, I run 28 lands. This lets me get, generally speaking, two when I cast it. I'll try to reserve this for getting two lands if I can. If I'm on the play, honestly, I can miss a land drop to pull two lands from my deck with this. It doesn't hurt me that much. Also, if you just need the shuffle effect, this is a great way to do it. If you're using Sensei Divining Top or any sort of deck, uh, top deck manipulation, this gives you that shuffle with the added benefit of grabbing eight planes. I love Tithe. I don't think a lot of people use it because they don't feel they need land tutors in this fashion, but I think it is one of the better effects, especially if your deck requires white. I mean, a lot of the cards we, we discussed here are actually double white, and we have one more card we're going to discuss that's double white as well. So Tithe is going to help you get there. I think it's a really valuable card. I think it's $10 to $15, certainly worth the cost of admission, should certainly see more play. The next card I want to talk about is Open the Armory. It's, it's an oddity. So if you just need equipment, I would highly recommend Steel Shaper's Gift over this. However, uh, for one generic and one white, sorcery speed, search your library for an aura or equipment card, reveal it, and put it into your hand, and then shuffle your library. It is sorcery speed. That's not the end of the world. I mean, Demonic Tutor sorcery speed, and we still love that card. If your deck relies on auras, and, and the first thing that comes to mind for me is an animate aura. This is going to let me grab Dance of the Dead, Animate Dead, Necromancy, and play those to help my reanimator strategy. Or if my deck relies on equipment, whatever that equipment might be. I mean, I, I use some pretty odd pieces of equipment, but I mean, a lot of people use Skull Clamp. Um, why wouldn't you want to grab Skull Clamp from your list? Drawing two cards is always good, especially if your deck is geared towards using that effect, manipulating it multiple times. Open the Armory is a phenomenal way to tutor them. I don't think it's played often enough because people kind of undervalue tutoring up auras and equipment. But if you have a list that's dependent on them, this is certainly one to use. 2CMC is just as good as Demonic Tutor if it's getting you something that's one, gonna benefit you largely in your game plan and or I'm specifically thinking of right now um, my Tashar list. This is great. I mean, it would be able to fetch my Piston Sledge, which is a sack outlet, my Skull Clamp, I love this card a lot. It's not on that list, but it very well could be and be super effective. It's also very, very cheap. I think it's like a dollar to pick up. So if you don't own Open the Armory, it's certainly one you should have in your white arsenal. Now, the last card I want to talk about here, it's, it's a lot of things. It's not just a tutor. But if you have any tutor, or rather, if you have any card, creature card in your list that's one CMC or less, uh, this is so well worth it. Ranger Captain of Eos. 
He is one generic and double white for a creature human soldier, 3-3 three, three body, big boy, for as long as he's on the battlefield. When Ranger Captain Eos enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a creature card with converted mana cost one or less, reveal it, and put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. Okay, so maybe your deck is reliant on Walking Ballista. We mentioned him earlier. That is a great card to grab with this guy, who also has one more effect. Sacrifice Ranger Captain of Eos, your opponents can't cast non-creature spells this turn. So I see a setup here for a combo turn with the tutoring for Walking Ballista, or if you, I, Savala Explorer Return, a list I'm working on currently, Wirewood Symbiote, you need that for the combo, uh, along with Mirror Entity, but we've got Creature Tutors Galore in Selesnia. This helps you get one of those pieces. In Heliod, you would just need him. You have Walking Ballista, congratulations. If you sacrifice him, you can also stop my opponents from casting non-creature spells. That's pretty much saying you can't cast spells this turn. Okay, fine, flash in your Snapcaster Mage. Then what? Great, you have Snapcaster Mage. <laughs> I'm not trying to win by swinging at you, at least in you know a white list, most white lists. I don't, I'm, I, maybe there's a white aggro list that, that's relevant, but I don't know of it. Ranger Captain of Eos, phenomenal tutor. I absolutely love this card. Any deck, I can squeeze this one into. The double white, I don't care. I, I value creatures in a lot of my packages. Even if that creature was just Mother of Ruins for recurring value. I mean, why the heck not? I will state that you definitely want this to be working on both of those axes, um, the tutoring and the sacrifice for silence. Like, it's nice to have that setup effect, but you do want to make sure that you're leveraging the tutor. So if you can prioritize that and use it to the best of its effect, then you certainly want this card in your list. Again, the double white will bar it from a lot of multicolored lists, three to four to five colors, but in the mono to dual color region, phenomenal card. Highly, highly recommended. So were there any cards mentioned today that you've never heard of? Am I a liar? Is it, are these not hidden gems? Is everyone on Tithe and I just don't know it? Um, I would love to hear your opinions on hidden gems and underplayed cards in your play group. Maybe there's a pet card that you found is amazing and is, is more than just your favorite card to play. It's a good card to play. Let me know in the comment section down below. I'd love to hear in any color what your favorite cards are. And of course, we'll take them into consideration for future segments just like this. I and the group have a bunch of cards we play that are pretty unconventional. I think me in particular with the mono list I've built, there's a lot of just weird chaff that you will not see in other lists that are really good. Whether they are hidden gems or underplayed for a reason is yet to be determined, but we'll love to hear your opinions moving forward so we can build more segments like this. I had to start with white. White is easily my favorite color, and I think some of these cards here can definitely see their, uh, their usage in other lists outside of white. Orm's Chant, Fragmentize, things like that. Phenomenal. Or give you and find. Again, why not? Simeon's Reclamation, one of my favorites. But gang, if you want to join in the conversation, of course you can do so in the comment section down below, but you can also do so on Twitter, Instagram, and Discord. Again, if you want to help support the channel, I would encourage you to do so via Patreon or Anchor or our partner TCG Player. Again, all of these cards can be found there and the best prices guaranteed can be found there. I'm sure if you're watching this as it's being aired, there's probably some shipping delay. So just do bear that in mind with any of these services. I mean, anything right now is pretty crazy. So again, take care of yourself first. But if you do want to hook us up, if you do care about the entertainment you're getting here, I really appreciate that. Now to round this video off, I'm going to go ahead and go to my Patreon page and see how many patrons uh, we have. Pa patrons, pa patrons. So to the patrons, for all of you listening, watching this out there right now, you guys are the best. I really appreciate your support. You have no idea how much it means that you care enough about this content to support us via Patreon. It means a whole lot. And up until we get to 99, I'm gonna say your names off. Uh, for anonymity, I'll just do your first names. And let me know if you care about your last names being in there. There's only five this time around, so it's not too many. John, thank you so much. Jordan, you're a boss. Leon, I don't know you, but I love you. Luke, why are you so strange? I used your last name, I'm sorry. Luke, you're great, thank you for joining. And Nick, Nick, I think this is organized by uh, first in, last out. So so you would be, you'd be the first patron here? Is that accurate? 
Nick, if that's true, thank you. Thank you for starting the trend. You're the best. You're the best of them all. And that's not going to change. But guys, thank you so much for your patronage. <laughs> I'm going to continue to read off names with the group once we all get together until we hit 99. And then, of course, I'll add some, <laughs> I'll add like a roll at the end instead because it would be insane mentioning anything over 100 names. But I mean, up to that is still pretty insane. Again, my name is Patrick Marlette. Thank you for joining me on another episode and happy brewing, babies.